I'm a graduate student with Susan McCooch at Cornell University. My dissertation largely focuses on um, trying to understand the genetics underlying how rice stores reserve carbohydrates in its stem and how it utilizes that for things such as grain filling. And so my project is sort of a hybrid between physiology and genetics. And so today I've been asked to talk to you guys about how rice plants perceive and respond to its environment. So I hope it's not too much basic science and I hope that it's interesting to you anyway. Um, so what is physiology? It's basically the study of how plants function. I like to think of it as the interface of a genotype or a variety with its environment. Um, and so when we t think about physiology, we think about phenotype and a lot of research revolves around stresses. Um, we think about genotype by environment interaction and of course the role of environment in how a trait expresses itself. And more specifically, physiologists study reproduction, so when your rice plants flower, how many seeds it sets, that's really important for growers such as yourself. Um, photosynthesis, this is the process that allows the plant to take inorganic um, carbon that's stored up in carbon dioxide that we breathe out and make them into plant and then eventually into the grain that we eat. Um, they study resistances against biotic and abiotic factors like pests and disease as well as um, climatic stresses and basic metabolism. So it runs the whole gamut of things you could ever study about a plant. And so I had a really hard time trying to figure out what I wanted to share with you today. So I decided on three stories. The first, um, I'll talk about two tales of rice tolerance to flooding, because um, water management is really important in growing rice. Secondly, I'd like to discuss how environmental variability may affect your crop. And third, um, Susan asked me to share a vision for rice um, for future climates. And so we'll start with the water. So there are different types of flooding. Um, that we observe, and this depends on how much it rains, how long it rains, the geographical features of a region, like topography, whether you're in a real low region or whether you're up higher, and of course the nature of the soil. And the first main type of flooding is a flash flood, and so this is something that occurs suddenly. It can damage rice plants, especially at the seedling stage when they're real young and you know not too sturdy yet. And um, rice seedlings normally respond to this type of stress by growing up because it's trying to breathe. It doesn't want to drown. Um, but the thing is they're really small at that stage and so it uses up a lot of energy. And then when the floods recede, they basically wilt and die because there's nothing left in them. They've totally spent. And these flash floods typically last no longer than a few weeks, so they're real quick. Um, the other type of flooding, which if you are really interested in deep water, um, can talk to Peter because he lived in Bangladesh for maybe 12 years? Yeah. Six, okay, I exaggerated, six years. Um, and these are large scale floods that occur for prolonged periods and they're more predictable. Um, the water levels range from a few to several meters and this may continue for several months. Um, and it's typical in Bangladesh and in parts of Southeast Asia. In fact, there's a special season for this, and they have special rice varieties that are adapted particularly to this deep water situation. And they're known as deep water rice. OK, so we can first talk about submergent stress, which is the first type of flooding, the flash floods. So in a real ideal situation, you've got your patties, um, it's dry, it's hot and sunny, and your rice grows very normally, and you have a good yield. Um, and contrast this to the flash flood situation, and you can see these photos taken in Southeast Asia, and the first one's from Indonesia, and the second from Thailand, and you can just see how devastating this type of stress could be. And in fact, this affects 20 million hectares in Asia, as well as a third of the rain-fed lowland areas in sub-Saharan Africa, which also grows a lot of rice. Um, in terms of economic losses, it causes about a billion dollars in losses in Asia every year. 
So it's a huge problem. And so when you have a problem that is so severe, obviously researchers want to figure out a solution. And so um, in 2006, scientists discovered a gene that is an ethylene response factor like gene that confers submergence tolerance to rice. Okay, so like I said before, most cultivars are not um, resistant to flash floods. They expend all their energy as seedlings when the flash flood comes and then they will after the floods recede. And they, most of them die within one week of complete submergence. And uh, there are a few tolerant lines. The one that they studied in particular in this study is called FR13A. It's an indica, um, but it's not very high yielding. It's adapted to a very specific region of the world. But the cool part about it is that it can survive up to two weeks of complete submergence. And so they wanted to figure out why. Can you still hear me back there? Have I gotten softer? OK. Um, and they discovered in this study that this, there's a gene called sub-1A that confers enhanced tolerance to plants. And they took that gene and moved it by using crosses into varieties that are very popularly grown in Asia. Because like I said before, FR13A is not very high yielding. Um, and they wanted to figure out why uh, it is tolerant. And so here, we can just look at how a flash flood intolerant variety deals with flash floods and how a tolerant variety deals with them. And so they're both growing normally at seedling stage. Um, the flash floods come, and the intolerant varieties elongate as a very normal response. And then the flash floods, rather than elongating, they go into sort of a, a stunted, dormant state. And so they, something is different about their mechanism that allows them to sort of go to sleep. And after the waters recede, rather than wilting, they have all this stored energy that they haven't used, um, which is really cool, actually. And go ahead. Does that still like delay heading or yeah. something else further down the line? Okay. It does, but alternatively, you just have a completely dead crop. <laughs> it's a tropical situation, so delaying heading is not going to be met with frost. Right? right, exactly. And then they looked further down into the mechanism, and uh, they figured out this nice pathway. So you have submergence, which is your stress. Um, this induces the production of ethylene, which is a plant hormone, and probably some of you are familiar with ethylene. It's the, it's the ripening hormone, so if you stick your tomatoes or your bananas that are still green in a brown paper bag, um, they'll ripen a little bit faster because they're surrounded by ethylene, which is actually the only plant hormone that's, in a, that's found in a gaseous state. So the ethylene, um, it promotes the expression of many genes, and one of which they found is sub-1A, and they characterize this as an ethylene response factor because it's induced by ethylene. And what sub-1A does is it induces another gene called slender rice 1, and that's function, that gene's function is to suppress GA signaling. Um, and GA is gibberellic acid, which is yet another plant hormone. And what that normally does is it promotes growth. So if you've got something, sub-1A, that's inducing something else, that's a repressor of something else, in the end, you're going to end up repressing whatever that original function is. And so in this case of submergent tolerant rice, um, we get plants that do not elongate and therefore they do not consume energy. And some of the other traits that they've measured in these submergence tolerant rice lines are that um, carbohydrate metabolism genes such as sucrose synthase, um, things that would get promoted when the plant utilizes carbohydrates to do whatever it needs to do are downregulated. And that makes sense. And so essentially, the take home message is that the rice seedling deals with submergence by going to sleep. And here we see that um, the breeders took this gene and integrated <coughs> it into mega varieties to make them tolerant to flash floods. This is Swarna, a very popular variety grown in Asia, in South Asia. And this is Swarna sub 1, which is really genetically close to Swarna, except for this one bit 
that was introduced from FR13A. So the phenotype is that it's tolerant to submergence. And in this case, they're growing without the stress. And you can see that they look almost the same, except Swarna sub 1 is actually a little bit earlier. So you can see that it's already headed, and the grains are starting to fill, whereas this is still not yet headed. So we don't see very many negative trade-offs in terms of growing a variety like Swarna sub 1. Um, in favorable conditions, which is really important. And then here we can see that Sorna sub 1A performs really well under flooding conditions. This is taken in July 31st in 2008, and this is after water has receded from a flash flood, and you can see how wet the fields are, and they don't look so good. Most of the times we want to see our seedlings sticking up very erect. They're kind of flopping over. But then you can see how well it recovers three months later on October 31st, 2008, and it looks like a completely normal crop. So this was a really fantastic thing to happen to the rice growing <coughs> community in Asia. You mentioned that it's a, tri it's a traditional variety that's bred for breeding, not a genetic. Yep. Um, so Susan just pointed out that the gene that confers the tolerance from FR13A was bred into Swarna through traditional crosses. And so this is not um, a transgenic by any means. They made a cross and then they, they did selection for the gene. Why, why would that make any difference? <laughs> because you, you don't Acceptance. have any GM rice in the field. <laughs> yeah, no, but if you, if you use biotechnology to transfer that gene, would it be any different? Yes, it would be different. It, the regulations it would be different. Oh, genome editing, yes. but not that. I mean, I think there's no, that's another conversation, but I just want to make the point that this is not GM rice. A, there's no GM rice anywhere in the world grown commercially, but B, it's a traditional farmer variety, a traditional mechanism, and it was easy to transfer because this one gene transferred the entire mechanism. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a very rare genetically to find such a simply inherited trait that does such a profound thing and can be transferred so easily. Yeah. It's very lucky. How long will it be stay under water and still recover? Two weeks. Two weeks. Yep. It's cool, right? What? It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> This is what right, this is what the five, and this is what the variation, the natural variation out there can do for us. In, in genetic, in a genetic context, yeah. Right, I mean, it, I, you know, any longer than that, it's eventually got to do some photosynthesis, yeah. yeah. If it's any longer than that, you get into deep water rice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, if you get any longer than that, you're going to have to find a different strategy to cope with it. So that brings us to the second type of flooding, which is deep water. And again, um, the deep water flooding contrast with the flash floods in that they are much longer in duration and they can grow and the water levels can be much higher. And in 2009, three years after sub 1A was discovered, um, scientists found two other ethylene resp response factors and they named them snorkel 1 and snorkel 2. The study was done in Japan and um, out of Moto Ishikari's group and he said that he named them these names because the word snorkel sounds very similar in Japanese and in English, which I don't know, but maybe, again, is that true? This might be up to several meters. I have a photo coming up. It's amazing. Um, so it's really cool. Two different types of flooding and two different mechanisms, but all of them are ethylene response factors. Um, all right, so let's look at how the unadapted versus the adapted varieties do. So got your normal rice growing, and in this case, the, the rice is usually at a later stage when the floods come. So they're not super, super small. Okay, so in the unadapted variety, the deep water comes and it's not usually able to keep up in growth because it's already reached the point where it's at full growth. However, in the deep water varieties, they can elongate as much as the water rises just to keep its head above the surface, just to have a few leaves up there so that it can 
access oxygen. Because what happens is, if you have a plant under water for a long time, it basically drowns because plants, even though they fix carbon dioxide, they need oxygen for cellular respiration, just like we do cellular respiration. Um, and this deep water, again, can last for several months. So it's pretty extreme. And this is the mechanism. You have, again, your stress, the submergence. Again, the same hormone um, is expressed. It's ethylene. And in this case, it induces the expression of snorkel 1 and snorkel 2, which are ethylene response factors. And again, gibberellic acid has a role. So in this case, they induce the production of gibberellic acid, which I said before promotes growth and elongation. And so in this case, this, you have rapid stem growth, um, and the plants get t really, really tall. So tall, in fact, that when the people harvest, they harvest in canoes um, going along, cutting the panicles off. Well, tall. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. <coughs> All right, and so I hope this works, but it's a video to show you um, just how this, how fast it can happen. <coughs> Uh, it's working. So on the left is your control, so this is the unadapted variety, and on your right is the deep water rice. And so it's the time lapse video. And these plants can elongate up to 20 centimeters a day. That's uh, about this much, which is just insane. I think it's really cool. Um, really tall. I'll show you a picture in now. Um, so this is. <laughs> this is Moto. He is the PI of the lab who um, published this study. And in case you can't see, that's him, and that is his rice plant. That's a deep water rice plant. And when you go out to harvest in canoes, it's like being in a pond that's 12 feet deep or 20 feet deep. You harvest those panicles from the top of the water. And that is rooted down deep. Well, yeah. some of them float. And some, floating yes. And what happens is that when the water goes down, the plants fall down, but then they rise up. That's right. And then form the is there a qualitative difference if that happens consistently or doesn't happen? Sure. So under normal conditions, if there's no flooding, the deep water rice behaves like a, a normal rice variety. It, it, there's nothing to induce that response. But this deep water rice is not very high yielding, which, I mean, it makes sense, right? You're putting so much energy into that growth that there's got to be a trade-off with yield. And so what they want to do is they want to find out the genes um, that are responsible for this trait, and then they want to try to breed it in to some of the varieties that have high yield and have the quality characteristics. And then maybe, you know, with the combinations, maybe the response won't be so extreme and maybe there won't be as many trade-offs. But yeah, this, this condition, um, this adaptation is very specific to a, a certain part of, of Southeast Asia where they have a, a deep water season. There's, so there's, yeah. They fall down, and they, 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 yeah. they, 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 they sprout up, and then they fall down. But the way this water works, it's, it's a fairly predictable thing. That part of the uh, region floods every year, and you harvest it before it recedes. Oh, there's two types. It one, yeah, if the there's water were to just rise and fall, it would be yeah, a they, disaster. They do, they, they do harvest after it recedes, sometimes. But it's it, still it, it on top up, of the water. It bends yeah. up. Yeah. And then yeah. it falls on the ground again and they harvest it off the ground. There's, there's all these variations all in yeah. regions of the world where that land is, is really not useful for anything else except this. So even though the yields are low and the labor is high, they depend on that as their food. But there's a big difference in the deltas. Yeah. In some deltas, they've put in the infrastructure that you don't get that deep water. True. Yeah. And uh, so it's the deep water areas are decreasing. Mm -hmm. But what I, what I think one of the take homes for this group is there's this amazing genetic variation in rice. Oh yeah. Naturally there. And what we do is we har harness it and try to move it like adaptation to cold climates in short season. It's a dramatic adaptation. That's not where rice is normally adapted, right? So 
you can do a lot of things, just there's an elasticity in the genetics. And that's what breeders do is they harness it. So, mm -hmm. so I understand, it's a, all of a uh, kind of type of uh, guys has some similar characters. And I, I, I remember that's the, one of the, one of the graduate students was testing in the greenhouse to be more into using Nippon body, IR-60. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really So if the, you know, I I know it's the sort of uh, it's a temperate japonica in my town. Mm -hmm. Usually it's a typhoon here, right? But sometimes the, to, it, 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 the guys hardly feel completely under the water. Mm -hmm. But they're not dying. Mm -hmm. They have one day, two days. Sure. Sh short time, yeah. Short yep. time. Yep. If the water's not too, if the water's not too high, it can do that. Yeah. Does the yeah. gene pump any corresponding growth in the roots as well, or is it purely in the stems and leaves? That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer to that. They were mainly interested in the stem, but normally there is a trade-off between root growth and shoot growth. And so generally, such as under conditions of drought, um, the plant will choose, I guess, to send resources down to drive more root growth to access deeper water and stunt its root. Um, in this case, since the stress is above the surface and it's trying to get oxygen, I imagine that there's not as much root growth going on. But I don't know. Okay. So this brings us to um, the second story, which is how environmental variability may affect your crop. And I'm sure you guys all are familiar with this, actually, so I might be repeating some things. But um, it's good to sort of review this. So one thing that I thought is important is uh, temperature. Um, so some of the, there's positive and there's negative effects to high temperature. So some positive effects are it promotes grain filling um, and it can short, shorten the total growth duration, which might be important for a region that has a short growing period as it, it is. It enhances general metabolism. So when things are hotter, enzymes work a little bit faster um, and it induces remobilization of stored carbohydrate reserves in the, in the stems and um, helps it move from those, from those temporary storages into more active sinks, such as the panicle. And that's sort of where my area of research is. Some of the negative effects, of course, if you have extreme heat, is that too much heat during anthesis or the heading stage lead to spikelet infertility. Um, the male parts of the plants are typically really sensitive to temperature fluctuations. Um, too much heat also might lead to poor grain quality. There's been some preliminary research on that. Like if you hasten grain filling too much, it, it happens too fast and then the granules aren't <coughs> packed correctly. So that might lead to chalkiness. And then of course, hot, wet environments generally promote proliferation of fungus, which cause diseases. Um, and here are just a few photos of too much heat. So here are rice plants that are suffering from extreme heat and drought. You can see that that is completely not a closed canopy whatsoever. Um, the leaves are completely rolled as a response to, response to drought and heat. Um, I don't know if you've seen that in your crops since they're probably well irrigated. Um, and then of course, panicle or spikelet infertility um, in the in the right picture, where you have the really flat, unfilled drain. All right, so then moving on to cold, which is the other extreme. Um, some of the positive effects of cold, I couldn't come up with too many, but um, <laughs> it has been shown that relatively lower nighttime temperatures has been associated with higher historical yields. Um, there was a study that came out that showed, that did a bunch of modeling across maybe 20 years of historical data, and it their conclusion was that rising night temperature is what caused lower yields in the same varieties across time. And then I wrote that th th there haven't been, or I haven't found a lot of research reporting cold to be associated with spikelet infertility, but then Mia and says that there is, and it does occur in the Northeast US, it's just that most research 
is not done in the northeast U.S., so here it actually could be a problem for fertility. In Japan and Korea, there's a lot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then some of the negative effects that, so it's the opposite of heat in that metabolism and energy balance are affected and everything sort of slows down. And you probably don't want this to happen if you have a short growing season and mm -hmm. things are slowing down already. Um, so you have lower, slower grain filling, and so this could last one and a half months to two months, whereas if you had a hot condition, it could be 30 days. Um, and this might lead to inability to utilize stored carbohydrates so that when at harvest time, you're getting your grain, but a lot of that carbohydrate that the plant already took from the atmosphere is stuck in there, and you can't use it. Stuck in the stem. Stuck in the stem. Yep. Yes? I'm curious, so relatively lower nighttime temperatures um, well, in Celsius, let's see, so they did this study in the Philippines on uh, an indica variety and high nighttime temperatures, so optimal nighttime temperatures would be like 21 degrees Celsius, which is, I don't know, can someone convert it? Yeah, so it's warm. It's not cool in your mind, but let's yeah. say the highest yields in the world are coming from the temperate regions where they have cool nights. So California and Australia have some of the highest yields in the world, and they're growing temperature chronic because they have cool nights and really high radiance during the day, warm, hot days, and cool nights. And that cool is not different, that different than your cool, except that there are days they have much more luminescence and much higher. So in Japan, in Japan, the mountains are very Mm -hmm. But 50 is low. Yeah. It's pretty low. At some point, if it's too low at night, everything slows down and the, the sugars that are created in the leaves during the day won't be able to get moved around where they need to go. Because that's what that's usually happens at night. Um, if the temperature drops below 50 when, the flower, when it's flowering, you're going to get sterile. Yes? I think the, from other way to see this, in Northeast, this is probably water to dry, this is increase the yield or damage the rain. For many die, I think around 12 degrees Celsius, mm -hmm. for 24 hours or something along the period. And then you are foreign, many damage the mm -hmm. then we don't get any yield. Right. So we should worry. That yes. Yeah. Well, sorry, one other question. I'm just curious. So when it gets that cold, how much does the patty, what kind of buffer does the patty provide? I mean, that's, that's right. down here. You've got your yeah. flowering up here. Does that help at all? Yeah. It does help. I, I think so, yeah. I think so, yeah. One way yeah. to deal with that problem is that increase the amount of water at the highest possible during that time. And that gives your environment, even the cold still come. If it's water, they warm up to 80 degrees. And cold still come to 7 or 50 degrees temperature come two days. Maybe help a little bit. Mm -hmm. But if it's one day much, then try more cold. If you have that level of water control, yeah. you don't use water anyway. Right? No, so mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Is there any studies on? I actually don't know of, I, I don't personally know of any study that has looked into water management and controlling the effects of temperature. Um, this is something that people really should look into, but. Um, That's right. You say, what's the water source? Water source from a river or a ground water? The temperature is it's different. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't think that's been done, but that's something you could experiment with yourself as well, if you want to. Yes? I got a question for the other growers. If, uh, I was wondering if anyone needs his grow cover earlier on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the nursery. In the nursery. Right, so in terms of management, you guys would know a lot more. I don't. <laughs> 
I mean, if you had really high value crop and you could justify the, the labor and the expense, because you'd have to put it down, pour it off, right? Mm -hmm. You have to have the arcs and everything. It's a, I see it done in seed production environments where the seed is so high value that people will, will be willing to do it. Mm -hmm. But I can't imagine in a production environment that it'll be economical. Too hot also, I yeah. think Leah mentioned it, the, with the temperature panicles, if you're in the early stages, if your temperatures are too warm, you'll get premature um, yeah. heading. Yeah. Yeah. And a couple heads that are coming yeah. out and the rest are way behind. So you yeah. have to worry about the temperatures early mm -hmm. What's very interesting is that something like Nipombare, which has got almost no temperature well, photoperiod sensitivity. Photoperiod sensitivity puts a break on temperature sensitivity. The two are linked. And normally the plant gets, um, because you experience in the, on the planet, you typically experience uh, short days and temperature related, temperature and photoperiod related. So you get long days in summer and high temperatures. And you get short days in winter and colder temperatures. So the two are linked in the, in the plant world as well. When you knock out photoperiod sensitivity, the plant becomes more susceptible to temperature variation. And since all of you are working with things that are non-photosensitive -photo temperature, they're more sensitive, they're hypersensitive to temperature. And so that's what Linda's mentioning. We, could, we sometimes see in our greenhouse this crazy situation. We've seen nipombre plants this high mm -hmm. with, you know, 10 leaves, but really, really, really small, really young plants shooting up um, panicles. Crazy, you know, bizarre stuff because our greenhouse is hot, but our light is very low. So you do have to be careful in the way in which those two balance out. And they are more sensitive to temperature because they're photo insensitive. Yeah. Okay, and then. I just have a photo up here of what cold stress at a, at a young plant stage looks like. And then I'd like to discuss quickly about solar radiation. So we all know that sunshine is really important to grow a good rice crop. They love the sun. Um, and there's trade-offs here too. So there's been tons of studies about what the optimal solar radiation for rice is, and I think it's, it's just a lot, a lot more than other crops. Um, and they found associations with high yield and good light. But then there's also some studies on how there's a relationship between high solar radiation and other things like methane production. So it's, it appears, at least in one study, that you get more methane emissions if you on, on lots of sunny days than if you have gloomy days. But I'm not sure if that can be mitigated that much because you probably want higher yield then <laughs> in the end. Well, don't forget that what's emitting the methane is the, is the microbial population, not the rice plant. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of work going on to shift the microbial population, which are the methane emitters, through plant, if, if you, what do you call it? Uh, a fuse. Yeah, it's through what the roots, em what emerges from the roots that can mitigate the way that the soil bacteria are. Mm -hmm. So I do think that methane is, I mean, it's, it's wrong to associate methane with rice. Methane are the microbes that grow in the flooded paddy in which we grow the rice. And we may be able to use the rice to shift that microbial population so it's not emitting ethane, methane. I guess that's you... That's really cool. cool. Yeah. It's not emitted in, a, in an upland situation, no. though. In an aerobic situation. Right. It's not. Sorry, you're looking at adjusting the, the rice so that the exudates coming out of the root will feed a different form of microbiome. Yep. Sure. There's lots mm -hmm. of that going on all over the world. It's one of the big ones under the, under the sustainability initiative that I mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. It's very cool. And it's mainstream research. There's nothing that's yeah. completely mainstream. Yeah. So I guess why I wanted to bring this up is that every, everything sort of has trade-offs and it just boils down to how the physiology works mechanistically. Everything is sort of networked. So if you tweak something, you're going to end up adjusting other things. Um, and then I just wanted to go into one more specific uh, response of the rice plant to light. And this is how 
rice plants or plants in general respond to its neighbors. Um, and this is through the ratio of red and far red light. So here, they're not rice plants. I couldn't find any pictures of rice plants because grass is kind of like they're either tall or short. I mean, it's easier to see in this plant, which is Arabidopsis, which is our, um, our lab rat of plants. And so we have two Arabidopsises, Arabidopsis plants. And if you hit it with a light that has a high ratio of red to far red, um, it'll respond one way. And if you hit it with a low ratio of red to far red light, it'll respond a different way. And this is what it looks like. So um, under conditions with high red to far red ratio, the plants will be short. And under the opposite conditions, they elongate. And the reason they do this is this is the mechanism by which they sense their neighbors. So um, in open fields without any neighboring plants, you'll, uh, you'll get sturdier, more bushy plants. Um, and in conditions where there's either shaded undergrowth, where the plants are in shaded undergrowth, or you can imagine a crop field that's really crowded with lots of plants neighboring it, um, you're going to get this response unless you breed it out. Um, so in, for plants that are capable of shade response, crowding may affect plant height, so they'll try to get taller to compete better for light. And there has been reported to be a trade-off between plant height and number of tillers it can put out. So it's all a, it's all a matter of resource allocation. Are you going to grow taller or, or wider? More tillers. Um, and then finally. Can you go back one time? Yes. So I want to just connect this with SRI. So SRI is typically trying to encourage people to plant wide spacing because they're assuming that the variety of plant is going to tiller and fill in that space. But in rice, we know that some plants don't do that. Yeah. And some plants, um, anyway, it's a genetic response to environment. So in some plants, if you space them, they fill in. That's typically an indica response. Tropical indica does that all the time. For you guys working with temperate japonica, usually the plant response is not to keep tillering. Because the only way a, a temperate japonica plant can get seed on it in a short season is to stop tillering and shoot itself up into grain production quickly. So it puts out a minimum number of tillers, and even when spaced widely, as you saw last year in this, it does not continue to till it. The temperate, the temperate genetics tell it not to tiller, but to go for grain production. So we have this trade-off, which is Lucy and I have been discussing it, which is the appropriate spacing for the appropriate variety. And what mm -hmm. Diane's talking about is sort of the reverse. If you want a certain spacing, we could breed the plant that would accommodate to that. But it might not get seed in a temperate environment if it's wide. It's not, it, it can't both tiller and produce a lot of seed in, this, in the space of time that you have for that plant to grow. So it's likely that your best spacing <coughs> in the temperate zone is going to be a little narrower than it would be in the tropics for even the SRI system. So there's an adjustment that needs to be made based on the genetics of what you're working with. So if you look out in the field, um, it's, the, it's the field that Sandy will be talking about, the, the Nevi field, the breeding project that we're working on. Um, if you look at the parent Della, and if you look, which is a tropical japonica that's uh, commonly planted in the southern states of the U.S., versus yukihikuri, which is a temperate japonica, you'll see that under the spacing that they've got going on, the temperates are really erect, and they, they don't fill in that space at all, where, whereas Della or some of the other plants will, they might not necessarily tiller more, but they, they spread a little bit more. They have a spreading response, which I've just seen pretty commonly in the tropical japonicas. Um, so yeah, it's really cool. And with, uh, I was in Ghana a few weeks ago, and uh, these, these I met these rice farmers and they're sort of experimental and they're like, ah, oh, we want to try this thing with spacing and so they tried the, the 20 by 20 centimeters and they had a whole other field with the 30 by 30 and for their varieties there they found that they really liked the 20 by 20 more because in the 30 by 30 there was too much space and the weeds just filled right in and so these centimeters are, I don't know how to convert that, but 30 centimeters maybe this much, this much. 12 inches, okay. 25 is 10 inches, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's all about the right management practice for your variety.
Um, okay, so then this brings me to my last part, and I thought it was sort of a tall order to give my vision for climate-ready rice, and so I think I have more questions than answers in the end. Um, so what can we expect in the future? Well, the climate scientists haven't really come to any agreement uh, from all their models, but there appears, it appears that there will be changes in precipitation, um, temperature, perhaps the mean and the variance. They're not totally clear on the variance because <coughs> the models aren't agreeing. Um, and perhaps also in the frequency of weather events. And then all those three above will affect growing, length, growing season length, as well as perhaps the geographic locations that will be optimal for certain crops. So right now we grow rice in the southern parts of the US, in Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, for the most part. But maybe whatever happens in the future, some crops might be moving more north. Um, and some might be moving more south. It totally depends. Not really sure. It's really hard to predict these things. And my second thought is, uh, or question is, whether an idiotype really exists. So a lot of these questions that I'm hearing and what, where research is going, it seems that people are trying to find what the right type of plant is for the next part. So in Here's a photo in the, in the, this leftmost plant is a representation of what traditional land races looked like prior to the Green Revolution for rice. So you see lots of tillers, not a whole lot of productive tillers, so there's not so many panicles, and they're tall and they're kind of skinny. Um, after the Green Revolution, we have something that looks more like the plants in the middle, which are the semi-dwarfs, they're short, um, they're erect, they have, lots of, they have lots of tillers, maybe not a huge percentage of productive tillers, but many, many tillers, and they're responsive to inputs. Um, what people are thinking now is that maybe we should go for more of a moderately tillering plant, but 100% productive tillers, and a little bit taller, because with such a short plant, you can't possibly get enough biomass to do enough photosynthesis to generate enough carbohydrate to fill all the grain that you would want. Um, I think that's a good approach. I also think that we have to think in different ways because if the future is not really predictable, you can't predict a good idiotype for that situation. And indeed, tolerance for stresses do come from unexpected sources. Here's a really cool story. So we already talked about the submergence tolerance um, gene, the sub-1A that was discovered and that protected seedlings from flash floods. So here are a couple plants grown in a pot, and one of them has the sub-1A gene, and they were, they drought stressed them. So it's totally the opposite of having too much water. They took away water, and they actually found out that the sub-1A plant all the way on the right, that gr that's the green one. That's the only one that recovered. And so this was a study done in UC Riverside, um, and the researchers proposed that the pathways that lead to tolerance for submergence and to drought, um, that the sub-1A is sort of a convergence point. So sometimes you just can't predict what you're going to find, so it's probably best not to limit ourselves right from the get-go. Um, and then lastly, I want to ask, what can you do? So lots of the questions that we've been getting is like, what is the best way to do this, or what, are, what was the question about, um, can we utilize the growing degree days that the maize community has generated, um, or, or their decision-making tools? Um, and the answer is we don't have the decision-making tools for the Northeast US, because it's such a new crop, and you guys are the, the information source that we can use to inform the models and the decision-making tools that will come. and so. That's why interactions between growers and consumers and researchers um, will create benefits for all parties because actually our incentives are all aligned. Um, I imagine that, I might be wrong, but I imagine that growers are interested in making a living, promoting their product, and probably they're specifically interested in marketability and reliability of that crop. Consumers are probably interested in price, 
satisfying their taste preferences and maybe novelty. Um, whereas from our side, we're, of course, we're interested in basic research, but we're also very focused on the applicability of our results and, you know, working in ways that can create impact. Um, and so I think Genevieve will talk more about this, but maybe we could initiate some sort of small scale citizen science interaction, um, do some on-farm data collection, because the, the answers to all the questions that you're asking will be, will be generated from this type of interaction. And so it involves making observations, taking notes, and probably later on some more systematic way of data collection. But obviously we know that not everyone has time to go out and collect like heavy duty data, but a little bit goes a long way and it can help us inform you know, hypotheses that we can use to write grants and just do more in general. So with that, I'm happy to take any more questions.